Mickner, Bernie is one of our uh, one of the regular Open Knowledge Melbourne attendees, um, and has not given me a a bio to read out, so I'll just let him tell you who he is. Otherwise, um, and I'll hand you over to Fred. Thanks, Fred. Hello. Okay, um, I'm just going to talk about um, open demography in a very general con conceptual way, rather than talking about anything you can specifically do. Maybe you could do some things from this. Um, I'm going to first ask you a question. What is demography? So think of a metaphor. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. And then I'm going to give you a minute to discuss it with your neighbor, because we want some interaction for once. So go ahead. So think of, think of what demography is. Don't just Google define demography and give me that answer. Think of it metaphorically. What is, what is demography? Who is she washy? Okay, now you could discuss it with somebody, please. Don't leave me hanging. Cuz, I'm gonna interrogate you. And whoever's looking quiet, I'm gonna interrogate first. <laughs> All right, so just yell it out. What's demography? Somebody. Anybody want to yell it out? Okay, study of... He said the study of populations. Somebody else? No, no more specific than that? Oh, yeah? Okay, I like that a lot as well. So that's Segmenting populations based on certain characteristics is what she said then. So one of the ways I'm gonna say it is that it is um, the way that the state sees um, its people. Um, so this is probably one of the most famous maps um, which shows how the state sees, well, the state of the US or of Great Britain, I think it was, uh, saw Russia in, the, in 1877. Another way that it could be seen is a lens that a company uses uh, in order to see who it is serving and who it's taking money from. So this map um, is particularly interesting. It represents where in Australia um, the Crown Casino in Melbourne, which is just an hour up the road, gets its population from. So 100... 81 to 100 percent of people in within the inner regional Victoria there have gone to the Crown Casino. Compare this to any other casino in the country, and you'll have a lot lower rate of incidence. At that lowest level, it's zero to 10 percent. So even when you're coming in far north Queensland, 10 percent of that population has gone and trafficked that casino. It doesn't say exactly what the distribution of harm that that casino is doing but it gives you a rough estimation. So it can be the lens of the company and also the lens of people who don't necessarily like what those companies are doing. So coming back to that consideration of what uh, demography is as a characterization of populations based on certain things, it's also a construction of identity. So this graph is of the resident population based on all on one, two, three, four, five, six censuses. Um, those differences in those populations aren't simply due to people having indigeneity as part of their, uh, as part of who they are naturally. It's their identification with it. So, the increase in the rates. Um, in the 2011 age distribution can't necessarily be exactly explained um, by uh, natural births and deaths. 
So people, cons people's identity are constructed not only by not only by the fact that they're indigenous or not, but by the way that it's the way that we build our demography, the way that we measure those populations, and the way that we measure those populations um, puts them into the right cubes. So this um, this di this picture is of a model prison based on um, Bentham's um, Bentham's prison, which is that there is a single observer in a tower, and surrounding that tower, all of the prisoners are lined up in cells. Um, so the people in the tower can only see the shadow of the people in those cells from the light protruding behind it. They can't see much about their characteristics, only that they're in those cells. Demography places people into these cells, and it places the demographer into that tower. But demography is also contested. I'll read these out to you so you don't have to necessarily read it yourself. For some, graffiti evokes fear and uneasiness about places and is viewed strictly as vandalism. This view tends to dominate public discourses. For others, graffiti is an important form of residence, one that allows those with little economic power to influence the urban landscape. The first, you can see a difference between, um, between the landscape of offensive images and the landscape of non-offensive graffiti, so street art. There's two dif in different areas, the street art can be seen in different ways based on the people in that area. But also, with the people who, to whom it's a form of resistance, that resistance will affect people in private, will affect private and public buildings in different ways. So it's demography impacting on the way that the landscape is perceived. So what is open demography then? We're gonna do the same thing. I'll give you a second to think about it and talk with others and then I'll ask a quick, ask a question. What does open mean in the context of demography? Maybe you'll have some more to say about this because it's using a term we all love. Hmm? What open boot means? So it's a like a boot of a car. Or It's a firmware of a microsystem. Okay. Okay, so, right, so it's a misnomer. It's not open. Demography is not open, yep. Okay. So, so he was saying that it's open boot, um, which is a project of Sun Microsystems, and whatever meaning you want to impose on that, um, you can do as you want. Anybody else? Sorry? That's, he didn't say that, sorry. What did you say? Okay, two words, nothing more, got it now. There is no de definition that can be had from it. Okay, anybody else have an opinion on that? Okay, you collect data and you share it. I think that's pretty essential to what being open about demography is. All right, so I'm going to say that there are two sides of open demography that we can talk about now, and you could say that there are obviously other ways you could conceptualize it. But um, I want to say that there's two ways. The first is that we want to use open collaboration. So we know about open software, the way that we produce open software. Somewhat in that sense, there's got to be something in open demography there. The other side is an open society. So, the Open Society Foundation calls the Open Society vibrant and tolerant democracies whose governments are accountable to their citizens. So we want our government to be accountable to, a, to its citizens. On the other hand, open collaboration is the, collabor is the process of 
depositing motivationally independent layers of work on top of each other over time. So let's start with open society. Here, uh, these cards are representing different demographics in the Australian census. Um, the on the left hand side, you have ancestry, language, and religious affiliation. The census doesn't give us all the categories we could possibly want. It doesn't give us, for instance, um, whether, um, whether people have a specific disability. That might be for good reasons. Another thing, which this diagram is probably illegible, but the shape of it should give you something. On that left-hand side, it says, we're, it says that there are many, many types of Christianity in Australia. So this is the Australian standard classification of religion. Um, but on the right-hand side, we have Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Judaism without any further detail in the census. So you can't go into what type of Buddhist people are, they're simply a Buddhist. But they could be all sort, they could be two sorts of Anglican. I guess High Anglican and Low Anglican, but they can't be any other sorts of those religions. There are four types of no religion, but there aren't any, any further types than one of, um, of the of three of four of the major world religions. So, where is the rest? So, I'm going to try and give you a question now. How could we improve religious and ethnic classifications in the Australian Bureau of Statistics? How would we go about doing that? That's that's a hard question to answer off the bat, but does anyone want to try? Hmm? Add more subcategories. Sub okay, yeah? In an open free format? Sure, you could try that. Let's, let's say that. Okay, anybody else? Yep? Take somebody, one of the directors out for lunch and have a chat with him about the classification system. Okay. So, the way that the census is done requires a lot of work for that to happen. So clearly a lot of people have been involved in this decision making to decide that Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Judaism are one specific thing. So the question I think is answered by deliberative processes. So in the construction of the format of our, of our national demography on the open society front, we need to include the people who we're trying to represent. We can't simply say that as a nation we've represented these people. So this law um, of Tuscany was passed in 2007, um, which, and what it did was any economic development programs in that region had to have a process where people could say, you need to talk to us about that. So people, anybody could submit an application which says, we need to have town meetings, we need to have an open process about it. Then they can change, then they can participate in the development of those regional and local policies and the, and the town would be then um, made to comply with those regulations. So that's starting on that side. I'll come back to it in a second. Open collaboration is the other hand. And so Howison and Crouston have put forward uh, four models. The first is that it has to be layerable. Somehow we have to make it so that the work of making demography is layerable. We have to have low instantiation and distribution costs. We can't build demography like we would software 
with just our hands and the keyboard, but we can still distribute it as open data, so on the internet. So that's low, but instantiation costs are our problem. And there's something in it about the license of that information, the license of, that, of, that, of the software that's used behind it. And the fourth thing that they said is that to use a open superposition, you need time for it to be developed and for people to put off harder work. So it can't be necessary. It has to be um, necessary in the bits that people do. So layerability. When it comes to creating some demographic statistics, how do we layer those on top of each other? If it's not representative for a specific area, it's not going to be able to be layered with other demography. The second point is um, that we need to estimate our populations um, and be able to infer between points. So if we know about Bayesian statistics, here's a, here's a way we can describe it. C3PO says to Han Solo, the, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. But Han says, never tell me the odds, and he goes through it, and the TIE fighters behind him are all destroyed. So the lesson there is that C-3PO clearly had something wrong and had, and had, had something wrong as well, and that's that um, Han is a badass, is the prior. So if you're going to estimate changes in those populations over time, it's layerable to use different priors. If you, don't, if you use classical models, you're going you're gonna to change the model every time you change it. The instantiation costs are a problem, but they're not necessarily an insurmountable problem. To create representative surveys, the most widely used um, method is to use a postal survey. You'll get a population of people who live at a certain location. Um, and that has costs associated with it that an individual couldn't do for their town, for their suburb. So if you have 50,000 letters that you need to post, you need to be able to print them, you need to be able to design them, you need to be able to stuff those letters into an envelope, and you need to be able to post it. So that costs organizations millions of dollars a year when they do their leafleting campaigns. If you're going to do the same thing for an open, for, for creating your own definition of your community, then you're going to have to offlay that cost somehow. And I'm not answering that question because I don't know how. One way that you can do that is through the distributed networks that we, um, that we use for uh, open source software. So if everybody, pushes, um, if everybody pushes the ball, it's a lot smaller a cost. Um, another thing when you're talking about the demography of perceptions um, is the invitation um, to go to areas and to review them and to think about all about what that, um, how accessible that area is to people. So, the open license. If we reflect back to our first slides about demography being performative, then the open source licenses for that, the GPU license um, or the GNU license aren't sufficient because people You must be accountable to those people that you're trying to represent. So how do you get that across? People need, need to be able to represent their own, um, their own definitions, their own classifications of who they are and where they fit with other people. 
So the promise of open demography is both open, so is, is two sides. It's open collaboration and it's open society. If we're to create open demography, it would have to balance the two. The first calls us to define our own public identities by creating our own demographics. And the second uh, calls us to try and fix national statistics. Yep, um, you didn't, yeah, I'm done. Huh? Yep, cool. it was much shorter than I thought. Because, cool, cool. yeah, I thought people would talk more. Cool. Any questions? Uh, hi. Um, so it seems to me that there's a bit of a delicate balancing act between, um, I guess, the needs or perceived needs of the state and the desires of the individuals for self-identification and the purposes to which those two things are putting this kind of information to are maybe different. And there are certain uses of demog demography that are done by the state for ideally altruistic reasons and obviously they can be subverted so how do you how do you see that playing out how do you how do you in a practical sense manage if if somebody says well I think I belong in this category whether it's you know religion or political affiliation or whatever but or medical status for instance um, you know self-reporting let's say of medical conditions isn't necessarily going to reflect what is necessary to run the health system for as an example. How do you kind of manage those competing tensions in a, in a kind of a practical sense? So, so what I'm saying is that there's two, two different types of exercise. One is creating statistics of your own and putting them online for yourself um, in order to self-identify. And the other is to improve the national statistics. So this deliberative... Um, this rule uh, was a way that they did it in Tuscany. Um, and I'm saying, what I'm trying to say, and it's quite difficult to get across quickly and succinctly, is that you can legislate that participation in the setup of the statistics that our country creates is necessary for it to go ahead. So you could you could set up in the Australian Bureau of Statistics that when we're, when we're defining the categories that we're going to lump all of our data from the census this year into, that we need to define those categories through a participatory process. And there are plenty of, I don't know if anybody here has seen participatory research, but there are ways that you can go about that process. Even if you did it through, say, um, an open card sorting exercise with people. You go to communities that you see that are clearly underrepresented by those uh, classifications at the moment, and you try and broaden those classifications based on what they perceive their community to have differences in and want to have differences in. So, so on the national level, it's about creating deliberative processes around the way that we create our statistics having people have a say in how those statistics are made, rather than leaving it up to somebody in an office to make that choice because they're just ill-equipped from their perspective to do that. Would that include, do you think, um, allowing the, the people to say these are the sorts of bits of information that we actually don't think it's useful to collect? You know, that maybe the government, maybe the state doesn't need certain pieces of information? Yeah. I think that, so this is the way that you create the census. A lot of us have, I, I have fears about the census, right, because they're collecting a lot of information about us and we don't necessarily trust the government. And the way to make greater trust in the government is to have people have that discussion and have that discussion publicly and in some depth. Um, 
just a very quick question. How do you propose to include the underrepresented sections of the community in that process? Uh, I come from the Endinong, which is in southeast Melbourne, uh, and uh, there are a number of communities there that are underrepresented in any section of public participation. Could you elaborate, please? Sure. Uh, okay, how would you, how would you in that community, I'm going to send that question back to you. Those communities, how do you think that the government could talk to them? Um, a number of those communities um, are not properly integrated in the life in the Australian society as yet. Mm -hmm. And they simply don't seem to care. How do you propose to engage them? Look, I'm not... I don't have the answer. I'm not here because I have the answer. I'm trying to have this discussion, but I think that there are ways that they can do it. For one thing, employing people from these communities to do these interactions. Continuing the discussion. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. You're not gonna get every, you know, see this is the thing with representation, is that you're not going to get a perfect representation of the community. But if you, if you start by having a deliberative process in it, start by talking to people in order to create those in the first place, that's a better place to start. So you were mentioning to us, asking, or you, you mentioned in that last slide about fixing the census or collection of data. How are you proposing to do that? So, so there, I haven't proposed much Actually, there's a bunch of deliberative researchers at ANU, at Monash, and at a number of the universities across Australia, and it's in the published literature how you would go about doing that. I'm saying, so what I'm trying to say is that one, one way that you can come about the complete decisions, um, once, you've got, once you've deliberated on some information, gone out and tried to consult with the community, I know that that's a flawed process, but trying is a better thing than not trying. Um, it's got, you've got to be better than not having representation of those religions at all. Um, then, so, um, then you can use a jury process to determine on, what's, on what should be the final classification to say, okay, maybe in this case, the population's too small and privacy considerations are over, but you include some people in a, you know, you have a jury of 12 and they make that final decision. That's one possible way. I mean, it's up for debate, but we need to experiment, I think. And experiment in the small. Any other questions? Cool, thanks Fred.